Well, the border is on everyone's mind during the ramp up to the November election, and candidates for national office have been headed to Texas to see for themselves what is going on. I went two weeks ago, and I couldn't believe the level of complexity at the root of this divisive issue. Since my return, President Biden has announced some executive orders, and Mexico has elected a new president. Will any of this matter? This is Perspective. Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Mike Beatonball of Map Media from the Map Media Studios here in Prosperity, South Carolina, and candidate for Congress in South Carolina's 3rd Congressional District. After listening for years about the border and now taking on the responsibility to be the representatives that will affect policy for the 3rd District here in South Carolina, it was time for me to get down there and see for myself. I have cousins who live in San Antonio, and after calling them for advice and connections, they put me in touch with a very special man, Sheriff Roy Boyd of Goliad County. Now, Goliad is located about 90 miles southeast of San Antonio and is one of the most important sites in the history of Texas independence. So I was very excited to go see it. In fact, it's so important, it's equal to, if not more than, the Alamo. Why is that? Well... It was at the Presidio in Goliad where over 400 Texans that had been captured after surrendering to the Mexican army were unmercifully executed in cold blood two weeks after the Alamo. This murderous act inspired the Texans in Sam Houston army to shout, Remember Goliad with equal furor to remember the Alamo. Goliad is currently the county seat of Goliad County, and I had the pleasure to sit down with Sheriff Roy Boyd in his office for this episode. Now, before I show it, I want to tell you about the flag you will see behind Sheriff Boyd's desk. When the first Texas Declaration for Independence was signed in Goliad on December 20th, 1835, the garrison hoisted a flag designed by Philip DeMint that showed a bloody arm and represented the notion that Texans would sacrifice their right arm for independence. A replica of that flag, signed by Texas Governor Greg Abbott, is mounted prominently behind the sheriff's desk and is visible right there behind his head in the video. This concept of liberty and sacrifice is a powerful notion in that part of the country, and Sheriff Boyd exemplifies all those qualities you would expect from a sheriff that serves Goliad County. You're about to listen in on a conversation that will help us all in South Carolina better understand what our law enforcement brethren are dealing with in South Texas and the subsequent responsibilities that we have here in South Carolina. The interview was pretty long, but I edited it down to about 40 minutes of all the pertinent points that we're talking about specific to the border. So, Enjoy the interview. So here we are in a very special place, Goliad, which is considered one of the birthplaces of Texas, with a very special guest. Well, I'm really the guest because I'm here, and we are in the office of Sheriff Roy Boyd. Hello, Sheriff. Howdy. How are you doing today? How, how are you doing? <laughs> doing well. Um, so, Sheriff, a lot of folks, when uh, when I told folks in South Carolina, some of the folks said, I'm, I'm going out to Texas, and I'm going to be, be able to meet uh, Roy Boyd. They go, you're going to meet? Sheriff Boyd? They must have thought about a different Sheriff Boyd. <laughs> no, they were thinking about you. So, um, and and I, I appreciate you asking me to come out. We had several meetings. So let's get right to the heart of the matter of why we're here and what I want to try to get a way for us to communicate and have a platform about the immigration crisis that is affecting Goliad County which is also indicative of what's happening in all over Texas. So could you, just for um, everybody listening, but also specifically um, the folks in South Carolina, a big picture thing that, that you could sit here and say, here's what you've been dealing with for the past three years. All right, so first off, we don't have an immigration issue. What we have is we have a slave trade issue because all of the immigration, so to speak, is actually controlled by the cartels in Mexico. The border is very secure, but not on our side. Our side is porous. But on the Mexican side, the cartel ruthlessly controls the border. And if you try to cross without paying the cartel or utilizing the cartel, 
then you will find yourself either tortured or killed. And we've seen that firsthand. We know exactly what that looks like. They've had train car loads of people killed for trying to cross the border without paying the cartel down in Mexico. We have, at the Goliad Sheriff's Office, have come across people who tried to come across previously without paying and were tortured and now have the scars to, to show. And so what everybody thinks is going on is immigration, people just coming across the border looking for a better way of life. But that's not truly what's going on. People are actually being rounded up in third world countries. They're being taken to camps in Central America. And then they are being handed over to the Mexican cartels. And they are being brought through Mexico and brought up to the border. Once they're there, they owe money to the cartel for getting them there. Even though many of them may not have even come voluntarily or they may have come under false pretenses. <clears throat> so, and depending on where you're coming from, You'll pay anywhere from two thousand to ten thousand plus dollars to cross the Rio Grande into Texas. Now they don't have this money in their pocket, so how does that work? No, some of them that have lesser amounts have paid that initial amount, but most of them have not. So what will happen is the cartel will bring them across the river, put them in a stash house. They will break them into smaller groups. They will take them up, typically to Houston, because Houston is the main distribution hub for slaves and drugs in the eastern half of the United States. And the cartel will get them there. And once they get them there, they are told that they now owe an additional $10,000 to the cartel. And at that point, they enter into slavery or indentured servitude. However you want to phrase it, they are no longer free individuals. And they will be sent off across the United States. And they have to pay off that debt. And if somebody is thinking that, well, then they can just escape. Well, it doesn't work that way because the cartel and the Mexican government are intertwined. And the cartel has all the data on their family members. And if they don't pay that debt, then they will kill their family members or they will enslave them, one of the two. And so they have to pay that debt off once they're here. And so they'll pay it off either unloading truckloads of cocaine or marijuana, or they may be sold to somebody who provides, you know, say maid service or lawn care service to hotels or other businesses, or they may, be, they may be forced to work in a kitchen. And what that looks like is you'll have you know, 15 illegal aliens living in a one-bedroom apartment for years on end together trying to pay off their debt while they work for somebody, you know, say kitchen help or something like that. And at the same time, they're being charged rent, they're being charged for electricity, they're being charged for, for water, all the food that they eat. So it is a vicious cycle. I have a a letter in my desk right behind me that came out of a sex slave house in Rockport, Texas, that articulates that once you're brought to the United States, it takes 8 to 13 years to buy your freedom. That's only if you don't get sold from one master to the next because what we've done is we have created a huge peon class in the United States of slaves all throughout the U.S., and it's in front of our eyes every day, but people don't realize it because it doesn't look like the slavery they show you on the History Channel. So let me ask you this. So, the, you know, we see the images of people going through the wall or getting across and going to the border agents that mm -hmm. say, hello, mm -hmm. pr process me, I yeah. want asylum. Yes. What is that different from the concept of the Godaways? And we'll talk about what that means to the folks that get <clears> in <throat> trucks and try to haul mm -hmm. butt to Houston. So the ones you see that come across and turn themselves over to Border Patrol, those are the people that the cartel knows they fit in certain categories that the Border Patrol is not going to turn back, that they're going to allow in the country. Like Families, women. women, children, stuff like that. The cartel will send them across because Border Patrol has very few resources actually protecting or patrolling the border. So they'll send them across. They tie up Border Patrol. Now, the Mexican cartels have an intelligence network all along the border, up to and including purchasing time on Chinese military satellites to watch what Border Patrol is doing in real time. And once all the Border Patrol come over to take those people, process them, and get them to the center so that they can be transported into the interior of the United States, while that's happening, the cartel brings in the criminals, those people that are released from third world prisons all over, all over South America and other places in the world. And they're being paid to do that by the governments? Well, it's, a, it's kind of a, a mixture of things. You have some governments that are paying the cartels and the Mexican government to make that happen. But you also have organizations like Hamas and, and, and uh, different ones like that that are also bringing people over here. 
And so, yeah, while you have bad state actors like China predominantly is a huge one, you have a lot of countries in the Middle East that are that are sending people here intentionally to get them in our country and embed them as insurgents here. But you also have those organizations like Hamas and Al Qaeda and them who are sending people over as well. So we have documentation. Y'all have documentation of catching these guys that are doing this. Yes. Let me ask you this because I watched a Godaways, and and I watched that video which was fabulous, and I'd recommend. I'm going to put a link about that video that Epic TV did, and notwithstanding the political lean of who they blame or whatever, but you sit there and listen to these sheriffs and listen to Sheriff from Kenny County who we met, Mm -hmm. who I met for the first time the other day, and Brent, the attorney, talk about what they've been going through in Kenny County because of people trying to get around and get through. So what exactly is that whole Godaway aspect? What is that? What Godaway means is those are people that aren't intercepted by Border Patrol. And so traditionally, uh, Border Patrol is out on the border patrolling in their vehicles and on foot and on horseback and they cut what they call sign that's footprint broken broken branches and they will go out and they will use that information to make a determination about how many people got away how many people were not intercepted by border patrol so in more modern times what they've come up with is these things called aerostats and they're basically large balloons that are tethered and they float high in the in the sky and they have really uh, high dollar high resolution gyroscopically stabilized cameras and they can see for over 25 miles and they're suspended from these balloons yes and and tethered into where they can't blow away exactly and so what they will do was those cameras will spot those gotaways because with new technology they'll pick up movement through radar and various things that they have and so they will count the gotaways with those with those balloons and they were all up and down the border but When, when were they put in Somewhere around 2011 or so, they brought the first one to a border op that we were working in Brooks County as a demonstration. So I'm going to say they probably really started coming in somewhere around 12 or 14. Gotcha. Somewhere near. They had them all up and down the border. But currently the The Texas border only? No, no. All of them? The whole thing? All the Southwest. They were up and down. You'd see them everywhere. Gotcha. And so what the Biden administration has done is they've taken all but four of them on the border with Mexico down. So just go through the, 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 the economics of what these people are making off of these folks coming in. So uh, my wife and I had dinner with uh, Senator Cruz not too long ago, and he was telling us that according to the studies out of Washington, D.C., the, the cartels had gone from $5 billion a year in slave trade. That's typically what they had been making to last year they made over 13 billion dollars is the is the federal government's estimation on slaves alone and now slave trade has surpassed drugs and other activities as far as generating revenue for the cartels because i can only sell you methamphetamine one time and you're going to smoke it and it's gone i can sell a human being multiple times if i know what i'm doing and if it's sex trafficking, they can sell that girl or that child a dozen times a day for turning tricks and making them money. Or if, they're, if they have people and they have their, their folks that are, that are providing those services, like you know, made service to hotels, lawn keeping, they can take those people, and when they get close to paying off the debt, they sell them to somebody else that's within their own organization in order to now indebt them for a longer period of time and continue to generate revenue for the organization itself. So in, in, in the third district of South Carolina, where I'm running for Congress now, um, where we see most of the Hispanics in our area, Newberry County, especially Saluda County. In Newberry County, we have a craft food plant that makes mm-hmm. sliced uh, turkey and processes turkeys. Um, the, the the labor force there became predominantly Hispanic in the late 90s, and that's one of the leading employers. Now we have others also that do that. And in Edgefield County, Saluda County, across the river from us, peach trees, seasonal truck crops, stuff like that. So we're we're a big target for a lot of these folks. My, my wife teaches English as a second language to these children that come in. The, the increase just in this year when she had to go through the process because it's all Title Three money going to support them. That's the process of her going through and, and putting in, I think it was originally eight, 70 or 80, 
has increased to almost 30% more just in the year. Those children that I sat down with, two weeks ago I sat down with them, and, and it, the preciousness of them, and they're looking at me, and I mm -hmm. said, what do you want to be? I want to be American policeman. I want to be the, I mean, you could see the light in their eyes, yeah. but my wife has told me the horror stories they've talked about of them getting up here. Is, are, are their families probably part of that whole system and of system of getting in here? Is that the same thing we're dealing with there? Yeah, because the cartel now has its hands in the migrant farm working. Nothing that makes money that, that touches Mexico is going to be allowed to come in the United States without the cartel getting their cut of it. It doesn't matter whether it's banking. It doesn't matter whether it's retail. It doesn't matter. The cartel is involved in it, and the cartel is getting a cut. In Mexico, they call it la mordida, or the bite, and the cartel gets a bite of everything. The government officials all get a bite because corruption is pervasive down there, and the government and, and and the cartels work hand in hand. And so they're all getting a bite out of that. And so you may drive by that peach field and you think, oh, man, those folks are down there, they're working hard. And they are. And they're, they're, they're making a better life for themselves. But that's not the, the totality of the story anymore. Now the cartel is involved. The cartel is keeping a big chunk of that money. Those people are never going to get out of poverty because the cartel is not going to allow them. And our own government has set up a system by which the cartel can run that system and keep those people impoverished and keep them from coming up. I mean, my jail captain here at the, at the Goliad County Sheriff's Office, he was raised a migrant farm worker. I mean, that's all they did. They went and worked crops everywhere. And that's what his family did. <clears throat> But his family worked their way up, and they became successful in their own right and have done everything they needed to do. I mean, he's now in charge of the jail here. But those days are fading and going away because— It's been industrialized. Well, it has by the cartels and by our government. By the cartels. So all the, most of the children from Guatemala— I mean, a lot of them don't Spanish it even their first language. It's Mon. I mean, mm -hmm. they're from the Mayan tribal areas. Yeah. Are the cartels sending people up there and say, come get a better life in America? Are, are they helping to bring them out? Yeah, they're being sold something that they're never, that they're never going to get. Because down, we've, we've interviewed a lot of folks. We arrest a lot of people in Goliad County that are tied to third world countries. We sit down and debrief those people. We've actually had media come in and interview some of them to get their stories because it's important that the word get out because it's like I explained to you before. Every human being is made in the image of God. Nobody has the right to take advantage or enslave somebody. And that's exactly what's happened. So we've, we've actually had media come in ex to expose what's going on with these people and how they're being exploited and enslaved. And it's amazing because they're told something down in Central America, South America, that is not achievable under the system by which they're going to find themselves in because they're coming to be slaves, but a lot of them don't know it at the time. Some of them know it, but the life here still looks better than what they have at home, and so they're willing to take the chance. And so there's a whole variety of things going on, but everything is touched by the cartels. This is not by happen chance. This stuff is happening on purpose. The logistics of getting these people here by the millions per year is just phenomenal. In our county, which is halfway between Laredo and Houston, we're 180 miles from the border. There was a point in time before we started our task force effort that we were in three to five pursuits every single week in this small county of 7,000 people. And each one of those pursuits was a pickup truck with a smuggler and probably about 15 illegal aliens in it. And it was phenomenal. But realize, we're probably not even trying to stop uh, less I mean, than 10% I mean, of reason, the cars that come that, that are smuggling through here. So the only reason you would be in pursuit is if you had probable cause to see a car go by and go, yeah. okay, we can chase after them and stop them. Yeah, we have to have a violation of law to stop somebody because we don't enforce immigration law. We don't. We don't have that authority. That's not something we need to be doing. We only enforce the laws of the state of Texas. Trespassing, speeding, those sorts yeah, of Yeah, we might stop a car for speeding and get in a pursuit. Next thing you know, you know, we've got anywhere from 12 to 18 illegal aliens on the ground running through the brush. Uh, over so the videos of this, I want to make it, I, I saw this because when I was down there talking with uh, Ray and uh, Sheriff uh, 
in uh, Zapata County when they would, you know, one um, deputy is driving the car, chasing, mm -hmm. and when they pull over, they will run the car into the bush, and all of a sudden it's like a uh, cover your mm -hmm. quail exploding out of the car. The guy, he could only catch one, yeah. maybe two, if he's lucky, and they're gone. Then they have ways to reconnect each other, don't yes. they, through cell phones? Yeah, they're, they're very technologically advanced. They have, for every one of those cars you see with the illegal aliens in it that we chase, there are multiple scout vehicles and intercept vehicles going up and down the highway in both directions. They're looking for law enforcement. They're looking for escape routes. They're looking for properties that look like nobody's on them in case they need to rally if they jump out. They are everywhere. And those people are embedded in our communities. Because as they come through Goliad, they're not sending a scout most of the time from Houston or the Valley. It's a scout coming from a neighboring town or even our own town that knows that there's a load coming through. And today between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., he's supposed to be out on the road just in case there's a bailout so he can go and pick up. We run into it all the time, but that that network they have is phenomenal because you have to understand in Mexico, the government does what they call the plaza system. And what the plaza system is, is the Mexican government will lease a geographic territory to organize crime. And they'll say, OK, you can run through this many kilos of meth, this many kilos of coke, this many pounds of marijuana, this many illegal aliens, this many stolen cars every month for, let's say, $5 million a month is your flat fee you pay the government to be able to conduct business in that area in Mexico. That's how it functions. Well, the cartel has now done that plaza system across the United States of America. And inside of each one of those plaza systems, there's a hierarchy. And they have, they have authorized distributors of pure cocaine, authorized distributors of meth, authorized distributors of marijuana, uh, people who are authorized to deal in stolen vehicles, but they also have scouts. They have people that steal license plates to put on stolen vehicles. They have, they have people that work in, in businesses to keep an eye on things and help move product that gets stuck in the supply chain. And there's people on the highway. Every time I get in my vehicle and I leave this town and I drive, it's typically 30 minutes to another town, I am going to pass multiple cartel operatives driving down the road. And so that is just how widespread it is because the cartel owns businesses they have banks they have money cashing places they are embedded within the communities and in businesses all throughout the united states now so the economic incentives let's just talk about this so on one of those cars with 10 let's just say 10 people hmm. how much is that load of humans worth to just the driver alone uh, anywhere from they'll get paid anywhere from five hundred dollars a, a head to two thousand twenty five hundred dollars a head. Depends on just how valuable. Just a driver. Just to drive it. Just to drive it. So for them to ride in that vehicle, you're looking at <clears throat> five thousand. It just depends on who you are and where you're from. But when you get to Houston, you're going to owe an additional about ten thousand dollars when you get there, no matter what. And most of them don't realize that until they get there. Oh yeah, they and, they know they're going to owe something. But they don't know exactly what they're going to owe because it's going to it's going to depend on who you are and where you're from and how well the cartel thinks, you know, you're controllable. Can, yeah. Not only are you controllable, but how much value do you have? Are you uh, they call the good looking girls especials. Those are specials and they will take them up. And those girls believe they're going to be either reunited with family or they're going to some destination here in the United States. But we found is if you're good looking, you're going to be a, you're going to be forced into prostitution, probably in Chinatown, Houston or shipped off somewhere else. But Chinatown, Houston is where they're going to break you in, so to speak. They're going to psychologically break you. They're going to intentionally uh, make you a drug addict. They're going to tattoo your face. You'll have somebody's name on your neck. You're a piece of property at that point. It's like Brandon Cattle. That's what they do to these women. What is the FBI doing about this? It's, it, once you get to Houston, the feds don't want to touch anything. And we've, we've dealt with that up there because we have task force officers assigned to the feds on the drug side. And they will, once you get up there, they'll be like, oh, that's just human smuggling. We're not going to mess with it. And you can see it everywhere up there. But they don't want to, they don't want to touch it. So, you know, I don't get bulletins from the FBI about, about, cartels and smuggling operations 
Uh, that's not what the FBI is interested in. What a mess. It's a greater mess than people realize. You know, look back and remember this. During all the hundreds of years of the African slave trade, an estimated 10 to 12.5 million slaves were brought from Africa to the Western Hemisphere. Four percent of those slaves came to North America. Four percent. Yeah. So. Because of the mortality rate in the sugarcane fields in the Caribbean. Yeah, the Caribbean. And all that. Yeah, I mean, the yellow, yellow fever killed off people like crazy back then. Yeah. So only 4% came to North America. On any given day today, there's an estimated 30 plus million slaves across the face of the earth. And I would argue that there's probably close to that now in the United States. Just slavery this indentured is, servitude slavery, yeah. co conditional slavery that these people have given up to be able to be because of their yeah of wanting to but be what here. you'll find is there's a lot of them that the work they're doing is not the work of their choice who's going to come here to become a drug addicted prostitute that's a process they put you through to break you and 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 sell your body you know 12 plus times a day for money that you're not going to get go forward i'm in the house of representatives <clears throat> i come down here what type of bill do we need to put in and what's the what's the step solution that we need to do to intervene and to stop this. We don't need any more laws. The laws are already on the books to take care of it. You have to have the will of the government to actually do their job. There's going to have to be a strong plan put in place that is going to have multiple points. You've got to have policy. You have to have diplomacy. You're going to have to have enforcement at the border that's going to have to be coupled with technology and a border wall. You're going to have to have enforcement in the interior. You're going to have to go after the cartels financially. You're going to have to take away the ability of transnational criminal organizations. And I'm not just talking about organizations from Mexico. I'm talking about all over the world because the Mexican cartels are in business with the Communist Chinese Party. They're in business with the North Korean organized crime and government. They are in business with the Syrians and the, and the Pakistani organized crime. They're in business with the domestic organized crime. They're in business with legitimate businesses right here in the United States. Week before last, we seized over a million dollars in cash from people close by this county, one county over, that were laundering, knowingly laundering drug money for the cartels. We seized their money and shut their business. It's a legitimate business that has been in operation for generations, and they are laundering money. So you're going to have to bring that to a stop. That is going to take a strong, coordinated enforcement effort between the feds, the state, and the local law enforcement. But the only way for that to happen is you're going to have to have a strong executive that comes in, works closely with Congress and Senate to begin to change the way the bureaucracy in the United States functions. Because currently, we no longer live in a republic. Mm -hmm. The problem is we've lost our voice because Congress will not defund the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy continue, runs the government, not Congress, not the Senate. And the problem with that is the bureaucracy doesn't answer to anybody. We have to get back to where Congress and the Senate, well, Congress really runs the country through the voice of the people, Congress and the president. And they need to be able to go through and defund those things that don't need to be taking place. And we need our government needs to answer to the people, not a bunch of bureaucrats that make their own rules and don't care what the people want because that's where we've found ourselves. So we're going to have to have the right leader in the White House. We're going That leader is going to have to have the right people around them with the testicular fortitude to tear down what exists and work with a Congress that has the willingness to begin to defund the bureaucratic system that has taken over the United States and replaced our republic with a socialist bureaucracy. The concept of socialism and communism is economic systems versus central control systems. So that's what you're talking about, not economically as much as central control. Central control. Well, it's a combination of the both because the control is going to control the economy. We will become a, a controlled economy instead of a free marketplace, and that's where we're headed. Well, one of, like, and, and I know you saw my 95 thesis, and one of my big concerns is the centralization of the economic system mm -hmm. through mega global corporations. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's still a capitalist system, 
But the thing is, it's all pulled, all the power pulled up into huge corporations yeah. that are, you know, when I'm driving down the streets here, I see Dollar Generals going up just like their Dollar Generals there. So where's the entrepreneurs that's able to open up their own store and have access to goods at the same mm -hmm. cheap cost that a huge corporation could come in and turning folks that are uh, used to be owners of small businesses. Every one of these towns on this square in Goliad, just like in, in South Carolina, were run by people who opened their mm -hmm. own stores. That's almost impossible now for them to access the goods. Yeah. And so that's yeah. what you're talking about, is that sort of central control and collusion well, between government more, and corporations. It's more than that. And you're right. I don't, I, I don't you know, dislike Walmart or Dollar General because they're successful. I want people to be able to go forward and be successful. What I don't like is the government basically going in with them to allow them to use their money to to influence policy that then works against the American people. Right. But I'll give you a good example. I have some friends that are that run banks. And so they tell me that the federal government is busy trying to shut down all local and regional banks. The government wants maybe two, three banks in the United States and everything will be a subsidiary. And that's where business is going to. And the government is is putting tremendous pressure on your regional and local bank to put them out of business. Mm -hmm. They are trying to force them to give all your personal information, all your financial information, all the time and track it, even though the federal government doesn't have the legal right to it. So they're making the bank try to do that so that they can obtain it from the bank with a phone call or through through a system by which the computers come together. And so that's what's going on. So one of the things I want to touch on is the is the notion that I w met with a gentleman down in um, a private uh, business owner in uh, Zapata County, mm -hmm. where he talked about how we can stop this is by starving the Mexican government of revenue. Okay. So tell me about that notion of what could work. I I actually presented this theory to the governor when all this when all this kicked off but I understand there's political ramifications because Mexico is our number one foreign trade partner but my my entire theory for fixing this is you have to fix it in Mexico if you try to fix it solely in the United States and this goes back to my diplomacy and policy then you will lose because when you allow the enemy to have a beachhead on your shores then it's only a matter of time before you're defeated. You're just constantly reacting. Anyway. Exactly. You've That's a go problem. To the and we call it the OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, and act. You're behind. They're resetting your OODA loop. You're not resetting there. So you never gain the advantage. So my the theory that I had put forward back in 2021 was the Mexican government is in partnership with the cartels. The Mexican, the members of the Mexican government, each are make, they're making millions upon millions and millions of dollars thanks to their partnership with the with the cartels. What you have to do is you have to take punitive measures that cause enough economic pain from the loss of legitimate revenue to outweigh the gain from their illegitimate uh, partnership with the cartels and force the Mexican government to eliminate the cartels. That's what you're going to have to do. And, do with Mexico, and with Mexico, it, it works something like this. This is what I had proposed. Shut down all the ports of entry. Shut them down. Tell them no more. So what we'll do is we're going to monitor the border. And if we can go one month without catching more than X number of illegal aliens and no more than this much drugs or this much contraband coming across the border, after one month, we'll open up one port of entry. And for every week that we maintain that, we will open up the next port of entry. And we'll continue, so on and so on. But as soon as that number changes and it starts to increase, we're going to shut all the ports of entry and start over with another month of shutdown again. And people say you can't do that. But we kind of did that when Kiki Camarino was killed. We've done well, it who before, was that? too. What, what? He was the DEA agent that was, uh, uh, that was highlighted in Narcos Mexico on Netflix. When Kiki was kidnapped, tortured, and killed, our government conducted an intense inspection effort along all the ports of entry, and we choked Mexico into giving up their people, their bad guys, and getting us Kiki Camarena's body back. Because had our government not done that, they never would have found Kiki's body. So you had mentioned, because you had mentioned this to me before, you had mentioned of 
a certain fund that could be used to help mitigate the, the, the economic losses of legitimate American businesses that are trying to do trade across because it would shut them down too. Yeah. So yeah. how do you do that? So, you know, the government has handed out billions and billions of dollars in COVID relief fund. And at the time, the state had a lot of it. My recommendation was instead of the state distributing that out to the counties and letting the counties have a free-for-all with all that money, take that money, identify those businesses that are going to be directly impacted as a result of that action, and use that money to help those businesses survive during that time period in which this was taking place. Well, and that so, money is gone now. Is there other pools of money that the feds give that that that, that could be targeted without it, having to spend more money than we have the, still? Well, you got to figure like forty five percent of the state of Texas is revenue comes through the federal government. Money we give the feds, the fed give us back part of it. Forty five percent of our annual budget is actually from from the federal government. So yeah, there's money there. Texas is going to run about a hundred billion dollar surplus in our economy this year. So is this a Texas thing that Texas could do then and not yeah, worry about the feds doing it? We have lots of money in the bank just in case. Texas, Texas is a conservative state, and because of the conservative nature of the state, it has created such a huge economic boom that the state has more money than they spend. Even though we've spent over $10 billion on border security, we still have tons of money in the bank. And I understand we need rainy day funds because there's going to be hard times. But this is a time in which we are either going to win or we are going to be defeated. And that defeat will not be pleasant for our kids or our grandkids. So um, Operation Lone Star, mm -hmm. give a little brief thing on that or right. what's happened. So Operation Lone Star started off as a state agency uh system by which the the state of texas was was sending dps was sending parks department and Wildlife, of public department Service. of public safety safety which is our state troopers your highway patrolmen right uh which the texas rangers are just a division under under dps sending our game wardens uh and some of the other state agencies down to the border to help to go down there and apprehend and and deter illegal and you know, uh, crossings from Mexico into, into Texas. And so the problem was we were still getting overrun by cartel activity all throughout Texas, but especially in South Texas and along these corridors. So uh, we had reached out to the governor, numerous sheriffs had, numerous county judges saying we're being overrun. Here in Goliad, we ended up discovering the largest inland cartel stash site ever discovered in the United States of America. And a stash site is where the cartel will go onto a piece of property that somebody owns that they don't live around here, they don't go on the property, they trespass, they'll strip stolen and cars. And these properties can be 10,000 acres. Oh, I mean, yeah. they're huge. My neighbor's pasture is 10,000 acres. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. So they will go in, strip stolen vehicles, store illegal aliens being transported. They'll use it as logistical waypoints, conduct operations out of those locations. So we were just getting overrun with the activity because we're a small sheriff's office with one to two people working on the streets at a time. And your you, population in this county 7, is? 7,012. 7,000. Yeah, yeah. So, and for every person, there's probably 100 head of cattle. So, you know, I mean, it, it's, there's a lot of pasture land around here, a lot of brush on the ground. And so they hide very easily throughout the county. And because and, you're here, the border's here, and Houston is here. You're right on the th on Man, the we're right in the middle. We are right in and the middle. And that's why it was the staff spot here. Yeah, exactly. And we, we discovered 16 of those in our county, as a matter of fact. 16. 16 that we just discovered on our own looking for them. And so, yes. And so went to the governor, said we're being overrun. So the governor called a special meeting with some of the border sheriffs and myself, uh, sheriff, uh, a sheriff out of, out of Lubbock County who's on the jail commission board and another sheriff out of Chambers County that uh, was on legislative affairs for the sheriff association. And we got in a room, the governor asked, we started talking about what we needed. We needed, we needed to be able to hire additional manpower, buy equipment, and focus on transnational criminal organizations, excuse me, operating within our juris, excuse me, jurisdictions. And so what the governor did was he, uh, he gave us a grant, Operation Lone Star grant to give money, not only to the state, but now to give it to local jurisdictions. So what we did was we got that money, uh, 
And so I asked some sheriffs to come together, and we formed the Operation Lone Star Task Force. Start Which off is where with, I met, met y'all's meeting the other day. Exactly. So it started off with eight sheriffs, and it expanded. Now it's about 35 agencies and growing. We have Operation Lone Star Task Force South, which comes out of the valley towards Houston along the Gulf Coast. We have Operation Lone Star Task Force West, which is led by uh, Sheriff Jim Stewart in, in uh, Wilson County over by San Antonio, and it goes from the border comes up all the way around into the hill country. We just started up our uh, Central Texas Operation Lone Star Task Force out of Waco, and it's Waco, the surrounding counties, and Parks and Wildlife is joining us. Uh, and we're starting the Greater Houston Operation Lone Star Task Force here in the next month or so. And then after that is solidified, we are starting the North Texas Operation Lone Star Task Force, which will actually be centered out of Dallas-Fort Worth with uh, – Sheriff Weyburn has volunteered to head up that, and he's going to partner with Sheriff Skinner up there. And we are going to work to take away the ability of transnational criminal organizations to generate a profit. And it works, and I know that, because in 2023, we had no bailouts in Goliad County because of our efforts. And how many do you have before that? Three to five a week. And so— And bailouts, meaning people chasing them and they bail out of the cars. Yeah, we chase them, they crash through a fence, they drive through the brush, they open the doors, and like a covey of quail, they're gone into the brush. And we're chasing them for the next 10 hours, we're looking for people. And that's a very manpower-intensive operation. And imagine doing that three to five times a week. So luckily, the governor gave me enough money to hire five additional people to do nothing but focus on transnational criminal organization cases. And communicate to them that they know. Because yeah. you did something, right? You did a sign... Yeah, I put signs up on the highways in Spanish that said, warning, uh, traffickers of humans and drugs, turn around and go around, do not enter Goliad County, or we will hunt you down and throw you in jail. And Homeland Security called me a couple weeks after those signs came up, and there was a picture of me in, in the press standing next to one of the signs. And Homeland Security said, the Gulf Cartel is passing your picture around. I said, oh, yeah, what are they saying? They're telling the people in charge of their smuggling operations in Texas that if they see a sign to take a different road because you're crazy gringo and they're afraid you'll shoot them and it's not worth the possible loss of revenue to drive through your county anymore. And so they started going around. And right now, they know, the cartel knows exactly which agencies are participating in Operation Lone Star Task Force and which are not. And if you participate, they're trying to go around you. If you're active, if you're not, if you're not a member, they'll drive right through you day in and day out. And that's exactly what they're doing. It, it's it's amazing, and I posted this when I showed the picture. An amazing effort of of connectivity with everybody, mm -hmm. and listening to y'all talk with each other about how yeah. to help share resources. It's yeah. it's and it's a decentralized system that you have. Yeah, it's everybody has an equal vote. Nobody's nobody's in charge of it. We coordinate it because the commander and myself we have a lot of experience running not only border security operations but SWAT operations. So. We, we help coordinate, and we're like advisors, and we go and we help other agencies, but they run their own stuff. Everybody has an equal say. Nobody's in charge, and that's just – that's the way it is, and we all come together, share information, share intelligence, share resources, and if somebody needs help, we all pack up and go help them because that's the way it's supposed to be. You know, the government steals people's money to give it to us to provide a service they may or may not want. The least we can do is make sure that we're using that money in the most cost-effective and efficient manner that we can and ensure that we're doing the job that we're supposed to be doing because uh, well, we, one of the th we don't need to use it without using it properly. Well, one of the things that I've really come to understand is seeing what y'all are doing down here as really the frontline trenches that's affecting us. It's not just an issue of mm -hmm. you having safety issues in your county. Yeah. You're putting up a buttress of things, uh, 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 a uh, impediment for this to happen in the rest of the country. And for that, we thank you for doing what well, you're doing. We're trying, but it's everywhere. You um, know, no matter where you're at, it's, it's impacting happening. you. Well, we're going to talk more about that, and I'll let you know more about ideas that we're going to have on that. But I told you we have a lot of shirts, and I wanted to share this because this is my theme on my campaign. What would Washington do? And what did Washington follow? He followed the uh, the example of uh, of Lucia Cincinnatus. That's right. Yep. Yep. He did. Oh, that's beautiful. Society's and I like that. Thank you. And this one. I like that. 
Do more. That's That ought to be our motto. I have one of Franklin that says do better. I don't have that one, but there you go. <laughs> well, while you're here, I want to give you something. This is a Bible, and it is, uh, it's one of the ones that has all the explanations in it. But it's got your name in there. And remember, remember the, the term public servant comes out of the book of Matthew 20, uh, 25 through 28. And I just wrote you a little deal. Always remember that we are here to serve and not to be served because that's Lord. exactly what we're here for. That's right. That's what we're here for. Thank you so much. I Thank appreciate you. it. Appreciate the time. Appreciate so you much. coming down and, and spending the time with us. Always remember, the power of our nation was built off the strength of our people. And it's people like Michael running for office as an independent who want to make a difference. That's exactly what this nation needs. People who are here to serve other people instead of doing things for themselves. The fact that he's willing to come down here to the border and listen to us and take a look at what we're doing instead of relying on reports from third parties. We appreciate everything he's doing. This is exactly what our nation needs, and this is the kind of candidacies that need to be taking place across the United States. Remember, Goliad, God bless America, God bless Texas, and make sure you're informed and you vote well. Thank you.